So in this video, I'm going to be talking about 3D figures and quadrilaterals. So the first thing I want to define is what is a cross section. Um, so cross section is a surface or shape that is or will be exposed by making a straight cut through something at multiple points. So what I like to think of it is if we have this cone and imagine those purple rectangles are pieces of paper. If you were able to cut the cone with a piece of paper, what shape would the cone make on that paper? Um, so if you cut the cone parallel to the base, if you insert that piece of paper parallel to the base, it would make a circle. If you angle it a little bit, it would make an ellipse, um, which is an oval. Uh, if you angle a little bit more, it'd make a parabola, like the y equals x squared, that kind of parabola. If you angle it even more, it would get a hyperbola. Um, yeah. So the reason why I talk about those is because in 3D figures, um, with kind of like the standard 3D figures, at least the ones I'm going to be going over, when you make a cross section parallel to the base, the shape you get is the base, the same shape as the base. So for example, in a rectangular prism, I drew it, you insert the rectangle to get that cross section, you still get that rectangular base as the cross section is the same one. So a rectangular prism is defined by three parameters, the sides of the base, x and y, and the side of the height, z. Um, and in this case, z is greater than x and y. Uh, if y or x was greater, you would just turn the rectangular prism so the longest side was the vertical one. So the way to think about a rectangular prism volume-wise is that if you have the area of the base, you just stack the base on top of itself as many times to fill up the height because that's the amount of space that the rectangular prism is occupying. It's that area of the base just times that height. So in other words, the volume of the rectangular prism is x, y, z. Very simple. Um, the surface area, well, there's two sides that have the area of the base, so that's 2xy, two sides that have x as the base and z as another side, um, so 2xz. And when I'm saying two sides that have those sides, um, like this side, this side of the rectangular prism has x as one side and z as another side. And then there's two sides that have y and z as their sides. So you just add that together, 2xy plus 2xz plus 2yz. Um, so the special case, x is y is z, that's when you get a cube. So the volume is just s cubed. In this place, uh, in this case, we're replacing x or y or z. We're just letting that be s. And then the surface area is 6s squared. So that's a rectangular prism. Now I'm going to talk about a pyramid. So um, I'm talking right now about a pyramid with a rectangular base. So the base has sides x and y. And then it has height h. And the really, something really important to remember in a pyramid and in a lot of shapes is that the height is obtained by dropping a, uh, by creating a perpendicular bisector to the base. So you drop a line straight down from this little point, the little tip, right down to the base and you make a right angle. Uh, that's what that square was. That's the height. The slant height is this side. Uh, and that's really important because that's something that people can make a lot of, you can make a lot of mistakes when you're trying to figure out the volume or the surface area, it's possible that they might have the slant height labeled and not the height. Um, I can actually explain how to get the slant height or the height when you have the other one defined. I'll do that in a minute. Um, I just wanted to go over, I already actually actually already wrote down the volume formula, but the volume formula is the area of the base times the height divided by three. And you may be wondering, so, Volume of base times height, that kind of makes sense. We saw that with the rectangular prism. But where does this divide by three come from? Well, the idea is that how before when we put in that cross section, the, we have the same base. We have that same rectangle showing up at each level. With a pyramid, you still have a rectangle showing up at each level, but the rectangle is getting smaller as we're going towards the top. Towards the top. And basically, if I were to put together, the idea is that if I were to put together two more rectangular prism, I'm sorry, two more pyramids, then I would get a rectangular prism with that xy base. Um, and that's just something that if you had three rectangular prisms, try to, I recommend that you try to put them together. Hopefully you can get the volume. Now surface area, um, 
so of course the surface area is going to include that area of the base but then it also includes that those areas of the sides um, so I'm operating under the assumption for now that we only have the height and not the slant height. If we have the slant, or I'm sorry, uh, I'm operating under the assumption right now that we have the slant height. Um, so if we have the slant height, well, you have two triangles that have X as the base and it has those, that slant height, and they're two isosceles triangles. And then you have two triangles that have Y as the base. I'm just doing squiggly lines to try to make it different and the slant height as the sides. Again, I saw triangles. So those triangles look like this. X is the base and then the slant height as the sides. I saw a triangle. Now the area of course of a triangle is one half base times height, but we have to figure out what the height of this triangle is to get this area. So we, we actually make another two triangles by bisecting the base and forming a right angle. So then that base will have length of x over 2 and the hypotenuse is s. And the reason why we're doing this is so that we can use Pythagoras theorem. So the hypotenuse squared, which is s squared, it is the sum of the two sides squared. So x, s squared equals h squared, where h is the height that we're trying to determine, plus x over 2 squared. And then just solving for um, h, h equals the square root of s squared minus the quantity x over 2 squared, which just evaluating that's the square root of s squared minus x squared over 4. And then I actually took out that over 1 over 4. Um, and I took that out as a coefficient of 1 half. So then the area of the triangle will be 1 half x times the area of the height. So we're going to get 1 quarter x times this funky square root term. And of course, um, with the y as the base, it's the same. You just replace x with y. So knowing that, then the surface area, again, x, y, the area of the base, and then we have two of the isosceles triangles with x as the base, so that's 1 half x, square root of 4 x squared minus x squared. Again, it's 1 half because I multiplied 2 times 1 quarter, and two of the isosceles triangles with y as the base, and that's the surface area. And um, just, I think this is an important note, so let's say that we're given a I'll do it both ways, but let's say we're given a um, pyramid that has, you know, you're given X and Y. And let's say in this case that we are given H. And you may be wondering, how do we determine S? Well, so first things first is I'm going to redraw the base. So the base is x, y, and then I actually, something that's going to be helpful is if I know the length of the diagonal in the base, because then I'm going to, I'm going to create, I'm going to create another triangle that way. Um, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Just the length of the diagonal of the base, if I'm calling it d, d of course is the square root of x squared minus y squared by Pythagoras, by Pythagorean theorem. So this is d. And the reason why I did that is because now I can have a new triangle. Let's see, do I actually, I think it's easier if I draw it this way. This is D. I can have a new triangle with the slant height as the two sides. So that's an isosceles triangle with D as the base and the slant heights of S. And actually, the height is h. And that's because the height goes from the top right down, straight down. It's going to form this little right angle to the base. So knowing that, I can solve for s. Again, um, I know that this is d over 2. So s by Pythagorean theorem is h, the square root of h squared plus d over 2 squared, square root of h squared plus d squared over 4, 1 half square root of 4 h squared plus d squared. So that's how you get the slant height when you're given the height. Now, what if I'm not given the height? What if I'm given the slant height? How do I find the actual height of the pyramid? In this case, just trying to draw another pyramid really quickly. In this case, I don't know H, but I have X, S, X, and Y. 
Um, so in this case, uh, a very similar idea, essentially the same idea. Um, so again, I know the length of the diagonal is D. It's the same as before because that was just dependent on X and Y. It wasn't dependent on S or H. And then I, again, form the same right triangle. But now instead of solving for S, I'm actually solving for H. So I have the same right triangle. Now I have S, S, D over two, D over two, D is the base. So then um, H equals the square root of S squared minus D over two squared, square root of S squared minus D squared over four. And that's one half the square root of four squared minus D squared. Okay, that was just a digression to explain if we're missing uh, either measurement, the height or the slant height in a pyramid, how to find out. Okay, moving on. Our next shape um, is a cone. Actually, I'm going to start with the cylinder first. Um, I'm sorry I already had these equations written. I'm going to erase them quickly. But um, so a cylinder very similar to the rectangular uh, prism, how that was just a bunch of the bases stacked together. A cylinder is a bunch of the circular bases stacked on top of each other. So of course, the area of a circle is pi r squared. And then we're just stacking it together h so that it fills up that height h to get the volume. Now, a surface area, if we think about a cylinder, uh, a cylinder is kind of composed, the surface of a cylinder is composed of three things. There are two circles, which are the bases. So um, again, the area of a circle is pi r squared. So two of that. And then this side is actually a rectangle. It's a rectangle, if we unfurl it, it's a rectangle that has h as one side and 2 pi r, which is the circumference of a circle, as another side. Um, and I'm not assuming necessarily that 2 pi r is greater than h. It could be like this as well, all depending on the dimensions of the cylinder. But knowing that, we can figure out the surface area, the area of that part of the cylinder as well. It's just 2 pi r h. So that's how we get the surface area of a cylinder. And the reason why I wanted to do a uh, cylinder before a cone is because the same thing as before with the, the relationship of the pyramid to a rectangular prism is very similar to the relationship of a cone to a cylinder. A cone, again, has that circular base, just like the cylinder, uh, but only has one base. So again, if we stack together three cones, we get a cylinder with the base, uh, two bases, the circle. So the volume which is the volume of a cylinder divided by three. Now, uh, the surface area is a little different. So the surface area will still have, um, of course, that pi r squared because it only has one circle. So it's gonna be pi r squared. Um, and then uh, it's gonna, so the surface area is half the surface area of a cylinder. So it's pi r squared, and instead of two pi r h, it's just pi r h. Um, I'm not gonna get into why that is, but just try to remember the surface area of a cone is half of the surface area of um, a cylinder. Just kind of like a, I don't really wanna get into it, but basically uh, stacking together those three cones, you're kind of blocking off part of the side of two of them. Uh, well, I should say you're blocking off like this side on the middle one and on this one, and this side on the middle one and on this one. Um, so you're blocking off like half the surface area essentially that way is kind of like, um, so I, I should say we took away this surface area. So that was like half. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, again, I actually have the formulas are written for a sphere. The sphere is defined by the radius. So that's how it defines the um, surface area and the volume. And then if we're working in a coordinate plane, if position matters, the, cent uh, the center of the sphere, the location will also be specified. Uh, but if not, it might not be. Um, and then the volume of the sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. And the surface area is 4 pi r squared. Um, and just something that I think is kind of cool is uh, Cavalieri's principle. So this says if two solids have the same height and the same cross-sectional cross -sectional area at every level, the solids have the same volume. So I think that this can be helpful because let's say that you're given a problem and you have this cylinder 
that has a radius of one and a height of three. But maybe you don't remember the formula for the volume of a cylinder and you wanna figure out the volume. But maybe you do remember the volume of a rectangular prism. Well, you could just create a rectangular prism that has the same cross, that has the same height, three as the cylinder, and it has the same cross-sectional area at every level. So the way that you do that is that you need, you need the rectangle x, y to be the same as the area of the circle, circular base, pi r squared. So x, y equals pi times one squared, which is pi. And an easy way to do that is just make x pi and y one. So then if we find the volume for such a rectangular prism, it's gonna be x, y, z, which is, which will just be three pi. Um, and I wrote it out and just checking if we do have, again, the, now we do have the formula for the volume of the cylinder, that's pi r squared h, pi times one squared times three, three pi, and it's the same. And I just think that's something that's kind of neat. Again, that's Cavalieri's principle. So you have two rectangular prisms, the same height, and the same cross-sectional area at every level. And it kind of makes sense why that would take up the same volume. It's kind of like you just almost like rearrange the same volume but in a different shape. Um, and then just the last thing, last thing to note on rectangular prisms is that density is mass or volume. So mass is like weight. Volume is how much space we're occupying. And so density is this ratio of weight to how much space we're occupying. And kind of a trick question that I've heard before is what weighs more, a ton of bricks or a ton of feathers? Now a ton just refers to the weight, so they actually both weigh the same. But the reason why someone might be inclined to initially answer that a ton of bricks weighs more is that actually bricks are more dense than feathers. So the volume occupied by a ton of feathers is gonna be much larger than the volume occupied by a ton of bricks. But again, they have the same mass, they weigh the same. So that's kind of it for rectangular prisms. I'm sorry, uh, 3D figures, which include rectangular prisms. Now I'm gonna move on to quadrilaterals. So quadrilateral is just a four-sided polygon. That's it. And remember, a polygon has to have straight sides and it has to be closed. Um, and I'm specifying that this particular type of polygon has to have four sides. So it can be regular, which is kind of like the shapes that people tend to think of when they think of quadrilaterals. So a square, a rhombus, a rectangle, an isosceles trapezoid, which is what I always think of when I think of a trapezoid, but not all trapezoids look like that. Or it can be irregular. Um, so all of these are all of these are quadrilaterals. This one actually kind of looks like a, a normal trapezoid um, because these two sides are parallel. But this one, no parallel. We're assuming that this is not a parallel side to that. No parallel sides, still a quadrilateral. This one, again, no parallel sides. It's still a polygon with four sides. What's not a quadrilateral is if there's a curved side if it's not closed, these are not polygons. Or if it's a polygon with the wrong number of sides, this is a triangle. Those are not quadrilaterals. So quadrilaterals can kind of be classified in um, an ascending order of properties. So with these arrows, as we're going down the diagram, the next the quadrilaterals on the next level still inherit the properties of the quadrilaterals coming above it. So um, basically like, oh, I have this first one labeled accent, but a trapezoid is still quadrilateral. And then this one, this is gonna be an isosceles trapezoid. An isosceles trapezoid is both a trapezoid. Oh my goodness, let me rewrite that so it's neater. Isosceles trapezoid. An isosceles trapezoid is both a trapezoid if we follow the arrows, do do do. And it's also a quadrilateral if we're going up. Um, so quadrilateral, again, four sides. A trapezoid is just, there's at least one pair of parallel sides. And I'm saying there's at least one pair because again, if there's two pairs of parallel sides, it doesn't stop being a trapezoid. It just might be another shape. But if it has one, then it automatically qualifies as a trapezoid. Now an isosceles trapezoid is a special type of trapezoid where the non-parallel sides are congruent, they're equal. And those sides are called the legs. So these two sides are equal. Um, also, an isosceles tra uh, trapezoid, as a result of this property, the diagonals are congruent.
So I just want to share a proof that the base angles of an isosceles trapezoid are congruent. So I have an isosceles trapezoid, which means that side AB is congruent to side CD, that side BC is parallel to AD. And then I added in this point X on AD such that CX is parallel to AB. That was by construction. Then um, I'm on number four now. Then it, the ABCX, that shape is a parallelogram and that's by construction because by definition of parallelogram, it's quadrilateral, has four sides, clearly a polygon, and it has two pairs of parallel sides. The opposite sides are parallel. That means that AB is congruent to XC because opposite sides of a parallelogram are congruent. Um, um, since AB is congruent to XC and I already had that AB was congruent to CD. CD is congruent to, I wrote CX, but XC by transitivity um, applied to one and five. Then angle CXD is congruent to angle D because the angles opposite the legs of an isosceles triangle are congruent. And the isosceles triangle I'm talking about is, um, I just said, XC is congruent to um, CD right there. This isosceles triangle. So then this angle is congruent to that angle just so you can visualize it a little bit better. Um, then angle A is congruent to angle CXD. Um, so basically, I was trying to explain this, but you imagine that AB and CX, so this is AB and this is CX, are transverses intersecting the parallel line BC, and um, this is AD. Um, so because of that, angle A is congruent to CXD. If you moved it across, um, here, you would get that those two angles were the same. Um, but then by transitivity, angle A is congruent to angle D. So I just showed that the angles on the base of the triangle, the bottom, sorry, the bottom part of the isosceles trapezoid are congruent. Next, angle B equals 180 minus angle A. And that's because going back to this parallelogram, opposite sides of a parallelogram are supplementary. So angle B is, is neighbor, sorry, not opposite, neighboring sides. So angle B is 180 minus angle A. Similarly, angle C is 180 minus angle D. Um, just imagine constructing a parallelogram BCDX. It would just go this way. The same thing, it's still a parallelogram. By construction, BX is parallel to CD. Um, and so then, yeah, I get that. Angle C equals 180 minus angle D. And then angle B is equal to angle C by substitution. And then just proof that diagonals of an isosceles trapezoid are congruent. Um, I was just showing that diagonals on this axis triangle are the pink dotted lines. So if you look at one uh, shape, you see that you get this upper, uh, you get this upper triangle. If you look at each one, you get this upper triangle. And so these are congruent um, isosceles triangles. They share this one side. And then uh, we know that these two sides are equal. And um, we just found out that these angles are equal. So by side angle side, uh, those are congruent about that. Um, so the next uh, quadrilateral is a parallelogram. So in this, there are two pairs of parallel sides. Um, obviously, it has to be the opposite sides are parallel. In addition to being parallel, they're, off they're also congruent. Furthermore, opposite angles are congruent. Um, and that comes from, like, we have two parallel lines intersecting each other. So this angle is the same as this angle, is the same as this angle, and this is 180 minus that, and this is 180 minus that, and it goes the other way as well. Uh, cons and consecutive angles add up to 180. So um, this, how I just said this is like two dashes, this is gonna be the one dash because it's flipping across. So that's gonna add up to 180. And the diagonals bisect each other, which means that um, uh, they're splitting each other in half. So this is congruent to that, and this is congruent to that. Um, in the trapezoid, it wasn't like that. The trapezoid, it was just um, can go to pink. The trapezoid, it was just that this is congruent to that. So the isosceles triangle at trapezoid, and this is congruent to that. Okay, so then um, parallelogram. It kind of splits off into two different, um, so both a rectangle and a rhombus, those are both parallelograms, but they don't overlap. 
So a rectangle has four right angles and the diagonals are congruent. Actually, the diagonal is the longest, um, fun fact, is the longest length possible to draw inside a rectangle. Um, and that's because it's the hypotenuse of a right triangle. So it's gonna be the longest side. And then a rhombus. So a rhombus has four equal sides. A rhombus is like a slanted square. So it has four equal sides. The diagonals are perpendicular. Oh, sorry, that was supposed to be orange. Diagonals are perpendicular. They're forming right angles. So even though the corners aren't perpendicular necessarily, the diagonals are. The diagonals bisect opposite angles. Um, these two are like split in half. Um, diagonals form four congruent right triangles. Uh, so this is 90 degrees. The sides are the same. So this side, um, that's 90 degrees. And then because of parallelogram, the um, diagonals bisect, we know that these sides are equal in this side. So by side angle, side, 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 they're uh, congruent triangles. Uh, and the diagonals form two pairs of congruent isosceles triangles. So that diagonals are, um, the diagonals are the same length. Uh, where does that stem from? Well, the diagonals are the same length because um, the sides are the same. So just, oh, sorry, no. Um, so the sides, um, sorry, I'm just trying to explain why these are two congruent isosceles triangles. Um, So because um, it created four congruent triangles, um, we're going to have that uh, adding together these two angles is the same as adding together these two angles. So those angles will be the same. And then by side angle side, there are two congruent isosceles triangles. That's a rhombus. And then what stems from both from the combination of the qualities of rhombus and a rectangle is a square. So a square inherits all of the other properties of all the other quadrilaterals. So the diagonals form four congruent isosceles right triangles. Um, so it just looks like this, but uh, it forms two. And then if we do the diagonal in the other direction, it forms another two. And then just to wrap up this video, I just wanted to ask some questions. So in this one, what is the value of X? So I feel like I just spoiled it because I just went over what a rhombus is, but um, this shape has four congruent sides, so and it's quadrilateral. So it could either be a rhombus or a square. But we see right away that the angle is 90 degrees, so we know it's going to be a rhombus. And it's actually the same for both of these. And how do we find the measurement of x? Well, um, opposite angles are congruent in a rhombus, so that's 87 degrees. What about this one, when we're told that this is 93 degrees? Well, if we're considering it like parallel lines, we're told that this is 93 degrees, and this is 93 degrees, and then x equals 180 minus 93 degrees, it's 87 degrees again. Um, and then just given these three shapes, which is a rhombus, which is a rectangle. So the first one, four congruent sides, so not a rectangle, uh, sorry, four congruent sides, so, um, I shouldn't say not a rectangle yet, but four congruent sides is indicating a rhombus, but then it's also 90 degrees angles uh, in the corners. So that's also indicating a rectangle. So it's both a rectangle and a rhombus. This is of course a square. This uh, does not have four equal sides, so it can't be a rhombus, but there are four 90 degrees angles, so it's a rectangle. And this one, there are four congruent sides, so it's a rhombus. Doesn't say anything about 90 degree angles, so not a rectangle. And of course, this one is the only one that is a square.